Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And we're going to talk a lot about politics today with my guest, Houston City Council Member Tiffany D. Thomas. Uh, Tiffany, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm honored to uh, share with you and your listeners and your followers. Happy to be here. Uh, it's been a, a, a tough last couple of years. And so I'm glad that we're in this space to talk about all things housing, politics in the city of Houston. Sure. So uh, I, I warned you, we, uh, I'm gonna, I told you guests on the podcast introduce themselves. So I've given your title uh, and we met in April uh, at, at an event sponsored by the Urban Reform Institute. And so I got acquainted with you there. But uh, imagine you've arrived somewhere, uh, and I know you're not bashful because I've seen you in public. <laughs> but imagine you have, uh, say, 45 seconds or a minute to introduce yourself. Please do, please do so. Wonderful. I'm Tiffany D. Thomas. I represent District F on the west side of Houston, the best side of Houston. We're also the cultural currency of the city, but we are the most diverse and the most uh, the most diverse in the city of Houston. Um, and so we are an example of what our nation will be, uh, what our nation is. And so it is my belief that if we can get it right in District F, we can get it right in our city. If we can get it right in our city, we can get it right in our county, our state, and so forth. So as the work goes in the district, is a model for the entire nation. Um, and I have the benefit of chairing the Housing and Community Affairs Committee for the city, um, and also serving as a faculty member at Prairie View. So I come to my political world um, with the practice and the policy. So the work that I get to do in the classroom around community development, housing, economic development, um, community research, I get to apply that to public policy and then also take that public policy into the classroom and prepare the next generation of leaders. And you were a graduate of Prairie View A and M, as I read in I your am. bio. And I, what, yes. what, what year was that, and what was your degree in, if you don't mind? Um, that, so I did my advanced training at Prairie View. I, my um, undergraduate alma mater is Sam Houston State University, and so I am a proud Bearcat. And our model of our institution is um, a measure of one's life is its service, uh, and so I believe that I, I exemplify that. So I am a proud Bearcat and a very proud Panther, and a faculty <laughs> member there. So, uh, well, great. That, uh, you didn't disappoint on the introduction there. Tell me, but let me, about the West Side, you said it's the most diverse part of Houston. That, that is interesting yeah. to me because I know I've been to Houston many times. My first book was on Interron. I spent a, a lot of time in Houston. It's the, the as I remember the, the, there are more languages. I don't know if it's New York or Houston, but more languages spoken in Houston than practically any other city in America. So when Absolutely. you say it's di diverse, tell me about District F and 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 how with the, with the how how you see the diversity. Which are the biggest uh, groups that are, are in the district, et cetera? Absolutely. And so in District F, I have uh, neighborhoods such as A Leaf, West Chase. Uh, the historic Piney Point. I know we're going to talk a little bit about them. Yeah. Uh, Briar Meadow, Tangle Wild, and Westmont. And so we, um, each neighborhood is very distinct, but particularly in A Leaf, which has its own independent school district, there are over 105 dialects spoken in the school, just in the school, which is a representation of what's happening in our community. 105 yeah, languages spoken easy. in the school. Wow. Easy. And so we have um, a strong refugee immigrant population. We um, have um, that's why I call us the cultural currency, because we're so welcoming. And just remember, like in the 80s and the 90s, the oil that, you know, people were coming into the community. We had a lot of apartments available. Um, it was at one point considered, you know, outside the city of Houston. Um, so we have a, a strong Asian community, Chinese, Vietnamese, um, South Asian community, Filipino, you know, we have that. Um, I have six consulates in District F, Mexico, Philippines, Indonesia, Costa Rica. Um, and so residents and, in, 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 uh, you know, uh, from the area, they live there, the consulate is there. So we are very diverse. We live, we work, we play, we have gone to school together. Um, and so that's why I say that we are a model because we've been doing it out here for generations, for decades. Um, you know, my neighbors next to me, one's Vietnamese, one's Hispanic, one's Chinese, one's Nigerian, one's from El Salvador who lives behind me. This is my neighborhood. Um, and we know each other, we play well together and we look and we look out for each other. So yes, we are very diverse. Um, and we also have very distinct business corridors. So just 
on Bel Air Boulevard in my district, you can see the Vietnamese community. Um, popular restaurants. There's this huge, huge Asian fusion trend happening right now. So you can go to almost any restaurant and there's a line wrapped around until they get there. But then on Beach Nut, you have a large Hispanic business presence. And then on Bissonette, you have a strong African presence. Lots of Nigerian American businesses that are there. And so that's a part of the fabric of our community. Great. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, but uh, one of the thing, the issue that you talked about back in April at the Urban Reform Institute um, meeting in uh, that we both attended was the issue of air properties. Yes. And, uh, you know, I consider myself fairly well educated and up to date on things and try and follow current events. But air properties, H-E-I-R, air properties. You talked about the issue uh, in particular and how this is a problem in Houston. Um, so it, it was new to me, so I'm sure it's going to be new to pretty much everyone listening to this. Uh, uh, well, most people or a lot of the people sure. listening to the podcast. What is the issue of air properties and why does it matter in terms of housing, particularly for low and middle income people? Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. And this is something that i you know, introduced to students in the classroom, but I will tell you when it really cemented for me as chair of housing, um, you know, uh, Hurricane Harvey, you know, we're still dealing with that and we were going through our programs as chair and, you know, we were really getting beat up with some bad press. And I remember specifically maybe the, the second month I was elected and I remember this public session and an older gentleman came to public session and was telling you know the mayor and council how he has was impacted by Harvey, but yet he cannot receive any help. The housing department just refuses to help him for some reason. And I'm sitting there, I'm newly elected, and I just assume, of course, the city, of course, we're not doing what we do. Until I was reading the backup materials, and I realized he didn't own the property. This property was. It was an air property that was assumed after the death of his mother. So he says. Mayor Turner, I've been in this home for 25 years. My mama gave me this property. Everybody knows my mama gave me this property. And I was like, ah. So the, the title, just to, be, so just to be clear, so the, the title, the deed was never transferred from his it mother's was never name transferred. Into, into his name. So Correct. he's effectively a, a, a squatter, the right term there, then he's squatting in a home. Him and whatever own. siblings, they become the heirs of that property. But this is where it gets difficult when we have federal funding to respond to disaster recovery. The language is very clear. You must have a clear title. Your taxes must be clear. Um, in order to participate in those programs, which made me think, ah, the federal language is not, it's not making space for cultural practices, particularly in the Black American community, air property, airship. That's a very common way of transferring either a home or land to family. Very common. Um, where, where you have multiple generations with some attachment, some presence, some connection correct. to a property where they may have lived there for a while or maybe not or trying to figure those things out. But but the, it, well, so it, it, as I said, this was new to me. So how widespread is the problem? How many people in Houston are affected or nationally? Has anyone really studied? Are there any good numbers on this? So I have a good colleague at Texas A&M that uh, at the law school who studies this from a land perspective, and he's great. But from the city's perspective, we're we're interrogating that data point now because mm. I really, you know, when I looked at the information and I realized it made me say, well, then how many of the applicants um, that applied for our disaster recovery for Harvey actually qualified or were disqualified? And I will tell you, close to 96 homes of families were disqualified simply because of that deed, simply because of that deed. So now when I hear, I'm still living in mold, I hear it differently. I hear it, so now I'm like, you must be an air property because the funding's there, the projects have been happening. Oh. So now it's no longer, you know, we're, the work is falling through the cracks. No, there was, you didn't meet a qualifier. So there were roughly like around 96 households um that did not have a clear title city city citywide citywide in houston or correct or? that qualified for hurricane harvey funds right and, so this and, was and really of those the, in district how many would those be of your constituents or do you know i, I no, i haven't I broken have it down in, haven't in broken my it district, down there. no um, but, uh, but that part that applied of for hurricane funds right but that idea of still living in mold to me that's interesting because 
well, mold is, can cause all kinds of health problems and nobody wants to live with that. But if you don't have the ability to borrow money or get some right. kind or a grant or something, then you're not going to be able to rip out the sheetrock or the, or the carpet. And if you don't whatever. legally own the home, you can't do anything. And if you don't legally own the property, as the city, we can't facilitate something on private property. But in Texas, Texas is queen and queen of private property rights. Right. So we can't come in and say, we're going to tear up your home because you're not even legally obligated to this home. Right. right. You don't have the authority to sign. And so when you the so part of the problem, so one was with the disaster recovery piece that really. Blew and it was, me away. And it was just the, it was the language in the relief in the rules. Correct. That language in the rules that need to be changed. Have you talked to the federal people about how that might be changed? Because this seems yeah, like a really the, difficult thing to deal with. Absolutely. And those are some of the policy recommendations we're hoping to address with our congressional delegation is to understand not just with black Americans, but there are cultural practices that happen in community around housing that need to be accounted for in language, right? Mm. So um, I, my community, we have, it is not uncommon for Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, for them to have multiple generations in a home. Sure grandparents, parents, children in the home. Um, but yet sometimes that's not accounted for in terms of other programs that, that they're not given credit for that. And right. so we have to address that at the federal level and then also look at the state level, which made me probe more about when we look at how we invest back in the neighborhood and the amount of the, the community wealth that is leaving that neighborhood because that home ownership is not there. So if a disaster or flood comes in, you don't own the home, your options are limited in terms of recovery. You may not have the funding to go get a private you know, construction loan, a rehab loan. You don't have the deed. You won't clear title. So who's going to leave, right? You can't do that. The person's deceased. If the property's not in probate, if there's no formal arrangements made and culturally mm. in the black community, we do not talk about death. We do not do that. And we don't do that because in our minds, there's a sneaky suspicion. If we talk about it, it's going to happen too soon. Mm. So we don't talk about it. And so there's a, there's a resistance. And what I've been charging some of my colleagues in the real estate industry, particularly, you know, brokers and real estate agents in terms of, you know, we're pushing the priority of becoming a home ownership and knowing that home ownership is a pathway to generational wealth. But we can't stop there just about acquiring the property. We have to start thinking about and what do we want this property to do for our family and our legacy in 30 years? Where do we want this to go? What do we how do we want to use this as a tool? Because we stop at first time home ownership. We have to get more black people uh, home ownership. We have to do these things. And that's great. And we've been doing that. But then what happens 20, 30 years from now? Right. Where do you want that property to go? And how do you want that property to be preserved? It also makes it very difficult from the city's perspective when we're looking at development and how to come in and reinvest in a neighborhood. Um, and I'm dealing with I'm, I have a Freedman's Town, Piney Point in my district. And Tuesday night, we hosted a town hall about adding more single family homes to that footprint. And I had to get signatures from the 10 homes that abut that property that the city owns. One's an estate. She just passed last year. One's a real estate firm. And we're in the meeting trying to figure out who's, who, who's the executor of the state. Right. Because none of the properties have been transitioned. And so then without the that signature we may not be able to add a home to that lot for approval so the the investment which they need they haven't had any type of development since 1959 right these seniors deserve to age in place and young families deserve to stay in a community in the city that they can afford and so we're dealing with that now even though this is not a harvey related project but just having the conversation with them sure. like well who's the executor who who has acquired the property they're like oh well it's and such and, such and, such and these folks may not have a lawyer, may not know a lawyer, don't and and would would some distrust of the of the system Absolutely. be part of this? I mean, don't speak frankly here just about, you know, whether, oh, well, you know, uh, this I'm worried about right. getting getting euchred, getting cheated out of something here. And I Absolutely. don't trust the system. Don't trust the man. Absolutely. And you combine that with a fear of, well, just, well, ignore it. And but then when the. When something happens, then there's that the, if these homes aren't improved, then there's a more more likelihood that they'll be dispossessed or somehow evicted. Correct. Or... 
Correct. And especially in neighborhoods where they struggle with enforcing the restrictions, mm-hmm. right? Um, in older communities, right. um, you know, and, and my the neighborhood I'm working in to add just eight to 10 single family homes. The average age in that neighborhood is like 72. And is this, right? and you mentioned, and you mentioned uh, Piney Point, which is not to be confused with Piney Point Village. No, um, which is, as I saw, is one of the richest census tracts yes. in America, which is west yes. of west of Piney Point. Yes. Um, but tell me about that. I thought that was interesting about the Freedman's Town. Uh, so how yes. long does that history go back? I, I was fascinated oh. by that part of of a, a district that you represent has a history that goes back to the Civil War era then? Absolutely. Uh, the emancipation of slaves. And in 1865, um, uh, 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 Sister Sarah and, and Reverend uh, Mac, uh, they created, originally the name was called Old Town Janetta, the Janetta Road in Houston and Piney Point, the overall community, because they had all the pine trees in right. that area. Piney Point, that Freedman's Town, the original cemetery still exists and the church. Um, and mm. we actually met at the church on Tuesday. So that footprint is still uh, there. And um, what's, so the, and what's there the name were, of that church? What's the name of that church? Pilgrim's Rest Missionary Baptist Church. Uh-huh. It is still there. So there are roughly six Freedman Town footprints in the city of Houston. Um, Freedman's Town in Fourth Ward gets a lot of the attention because it's closer to the downtown core. But there are roughly around six, Piney Point being one of them, and they're almost placed in almost you know every district. Mm. Um, um, and so when you, uh, so the, so so the freed slaves went out from downtown then to find cheap well, land. Well, they just formed their neighborhoods and, and formed all throughout and, the footprint and, and of congregated, the city. congregated around that. Right. And, but, so you have Freedman's town. They were, you know, in the core, you have Piney Point that were in the West that were in the County. They weren't even annexed. You have McGee Chapel, uh, the town of McGee, which the church is now on highway six near Bra Forest, but the original lot where they first settled was Bra Forest and Eldridge, if you're familiar with that mm, area. Okay. And so um, uh, those remnants are there, it's documented, it's in, it's in the history. And so what was so fascinating to me is how Piney Point had initially five neighborhoods. And now what remains is Carver Crest, the last remaining neighborhood, which I get to represent. And they're close to maybe a hundred wood frame homes mm. there. And those elders can recall when Lily White existed and when those other areas and communities existed. And to your point, and, and I'm sorry, the, when, when Lily White existed, what is Lily that White was a another Freedman's town. Oh, OK. Right. And so most of those Freedman towns and those churches, they fellowship with each other. And still today, there's still this connection to those certain areas and certain churches. Um, they commune together. They do you know, Sundays together because of just the you know, centuries of history. Right. Um, and so one of my commitments to them, because of poor planning practices, um, policies uh, that, you know, they just became they're surrounded by development and there were no protections for that neighborhood, um, making sure that they had new single family homes where families can purchase um, between the 80 and 100 percent AMI, where they can add to their footprint and continue with growth and also stop the city right away, which is the lot that we are going to develop and flip that into single family lots. Um, and so what works in our benefit uh, and, I, and I told them, I said, you know, that each administration in Houston, we have a strong former mayor. This mayor has a goal of 3,000 homes by 2023, 3,000 single family homes for purchase. And so we are on track. And this, I told them, frankly, this is my shot. I don't have much land in my district. We're developed. Y'all have the lots with 50 by 100 feet. We can actually do something significant in this neighborhood. And you know what was interesting to, to, to is really that spur to really spur the affordable housing because you made another point, uh, and I think it was maybe where you said on 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 Twitter that uh, I'm reading here. You said we're short seven million homes nationwide, and these were the facts that stunned me. Houston has the second highest eviction rate in the nation, second highest eviction rate, not the number, uh, second highest eviction rate in the nation, and the least amount of affordable homes in Texas and or nationally. And then you went on and you said it's doubtful hiring a lawyer for thousands of dollars is going to solve the housing crisis. So, you know, kind of reflecting back about, you know, that individual air of, a, of maybe living in a property. But 
the idea of hiring a lawyer and trying to work through the title and the deed and all those, those are expenses that they're not really thinking about that they need to incur no. because that's not no. something that is top of mind for them. Is that fair? No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not top of mind. And I, I was sharing this with the Chronicle about air properties. I said, you know, if there's a certain level of, of education and financial acumen one has when they're doing the state planning, right? right? For you to consciously look at estate planning and have multiple properties, you understand the tool of a trust, you understand these things. But if you are first generation, second generation home ownership and you had land, it's always been around. And we're not openly having conversations about what happens when mom and dad pass away. What do we right. want to do? And it right. was interesting. I was at a conversation and someone a panel and she says i'm having this conversation with my parents she goes my parents have acquired acres of land and it's worth a lot and they refuse to have the conversation she's like i have four siblings right and so if i have four siblings and we all have our own idea about what needs to happen it to this gets, property, it gets it, messy it yeah. gets messy and um i'm the beneficiary of an air property my grandmother my great grandmother owns the land that says welcome to louisiana and they had contracted to drill oil. So I get $90 a month. My from brother the, and I get $90 from the, from the mineral From the mineral rights. Absolutely. But um, my grandmother had six or seven children. They had 11 siblings themselves, right? Yeah. So it's just, you know, my father's family, lots of land in Mississippi. Lots right. of land. They sold it. So it's all of us have our own ideals about what happens with that property. And if our... If we don't have those conversations early and openly talking about the protections in place, it will be messy and cities and, and CDCs won't have the ability to really come in and do things. I'm sorry, CDC, that would, C, C, CDCs? Our community me. development corporation. Thank you. Um, our community development corporations in the city, uh, many of them are leading around redevelopment activities and we're supporting them doing that. But it's definitely hard when there's resistance to it because the paperwork isn't clean. Sure. Well, so is, you know, Houston continues to get hit. I mean, you know, we're all looking at hurricanes and the rest of it, but where is the mayor's talked about adding more housing? Let me ask the question this way. How, why is housing so important to wealth building? I mean, I could pr try and answer this question and you, you met Joel Kotkin at, at the urban reform Institute and the work he's doing on that. Why is home ownership so important and, and why are, uh, African-Americans, low-income people, why is it so hard for them to own their homes? Sure. So so I'm going to say so personally, so home ownership is extremely important because it's an asset. Yeah. And you can leverage the equity in your home uh, for a, a variety of ways, right? And so it's a financial tool. And so we have to change the perception of just home ownership mm. and really talk about how it's a financial tool for potentially your future. There are countless the number of the parents that have said, I took out an equity loan on my home when it was time for my children to go to college right? because they had it and they knew they could put it back in, right? Um, or you needed to do some repairs, you wanted to upgrade. You have value in your home. And so um, one of the challenges and the things that I'm working on, I'm really to educate, and I believe HUD has made some adjustments around this is the private mortgage insurance, mm. right? And if we just talk about what's happening in the market around affordability um, and the fact that you know African-Americans and those who have lower you know income you're not able to compete at a three hundred and thirty thousand dollar home when you're making you know seventy or sixty thousand dollars right um and so when we look at generational wealth and from that looking at it as an asset being able to transfer that to the next generation where the next generation can come in with equity yeah you're not starting over with wealth building you can leverage and when we think about our most wealthy families you know the you know chase and all the bankers and the rockefellers this is transferred wealth right you know this is transferred wealth and so we have to get to the point of transferring wealth and removing every barrier to do that hud recently announced and I say recently as a couple of months ago they are removing the private mortgage insurance from um hud the fha backed loans from 2015 i missed the mark i'm a 2014 i was looking at the details like do i qualify for this 
2015 back so you can, if you had not closed on your loan and you still have an open case number, they will remove that private mortgage insurance, which is very helpful because it allows you to pay directly to your principal and that money is not just going out um, of the door. And so there are some, some, some small pivots that have been happening. And so at the local level, we are investing more in our first time buyer assistance with mm -hmm. these families so they can compete and actually secure a home because they're, you know, you can't keep a home on the market these days. Um, and so if we do not do that, we will create a permanent rental class. Um, and so we have tried, we have got to get people into these single family homes for, at, with the mortgage um, because otherwise the venture capitalists that are coming in and buying up complete neighborhood, you, that's completely off the market. There's no way you can compete with those type of investors. So right. then now you are relegated to paying $2,500 in rent. And yet the financiers and, and building and building and building no equity and you're part and of building the, uh, no equity and you're part and of that yet, per permanent yeah. rental class. Right. Which which prevents generational wealth building. Well, because yeah. we're I, I'm paying twenty five hundred, but the financiers saying, well, oh, you're not credit worthy. Well, wh I'm paying twenty five hundred a month. Yeah. For 24 months. And right. so we have to make sure that that aligns to address because if they're showing a level of consistency, when you get a mortgage, they see your payment history. If they're paying what a mortgage would be more than a mortgage, clearly right. they can sustain um, a household. And so that is a very aggressive goal for us for the 3000 homes. And we are tracking to make that happen by the end of 2023. So let's talk about Houston. It's, it's a city that's f famous for a lot of reasons, right? But one of them is that it has no zoning. And yes. and is that, talk about that a little bit. I'm, you know, I've, I've read about it a lot, but now you're in government, you're a policymaker. Is that good that the city doesn't have zoning? Does it, is it bad? Does it affect your district? How do you see it? Does the city, <laughs> should it have zoning? So we, ha we have planning principles mm -hmm. and we have guidelines that we follow. I can tell you about some of the challenges is that when, because we don't have zoning, we have bars and clubs and um, that pop up and might be right next to your neighborhood, your home. And we get an incredible amount of complaints around noise, around mm -hmm. parking. Um, parking is a huge issue in certain um corridors in our city because we have no zoning and you literally can build um, a commercial property on the backside of a residential right. and open a club. And so it really looking at how our ordinances have teeth to protect, you know, resident residential communities, you know, Joe Jane Houston, but then also how do we create space for the small business, the entrepreneur to create, you know, to start and contribute to the economy? We want that to happen because that we need your sales tax, which generates to our city budget. We sure. want the revenue. But we went it last even on Tuesday, we had complaints from someone about a club, you know, a restaurant again, because it's situated around a residential so, so, area. So close to a residential area. It's very close. I, I mean, many of the complaints, they can't get out their home because the cars are parked in front of the driveway. They hmm. can't, especially older neighborhoods that are now more trendy, right? Uh, right. They can't get out. There's cr increased crime. They've had cars robbed. Um, they've had, you know, indecent behavior in the middle of the night. They have young children and that need to sleep. Um, in my district, particularly, there have been gunshots in the area where the, the gunshots have gone through the home of a five-year-old. Um, through, through his bedroom. So th those are some of the challenges. Some of the, the pros with that is that if you are a developer and you're looking to, and you know, support small, you know, uh, housing or even just some type of commercial small business, you have opportunity to do so, you know, um, with, with less friction from less government friction. Yeah. So, Correct. and how long have you been in Houston? Tell me about your, because you have deep roots. I, I read on your bio that in New Orleans as well. So yes. you have, you have deep roots in, in the South, but how long yes, have you I been, can, yes, how long have I you been in Houston? A, I consider myself a Houstonian though. I don't know if my family would say that, but I consider myself <laughs> a Houstonian. And so um, we have been here since the nineties mm -hmm. or so. So I finished high school out here and my, you know, my parents, the first home they purchased out here was an A-Leaf. Mm -hmm. um, and my 
uh, father still lives in that home and, and my neighbors that I and their children that I grew up with, they're still there. Uh, and so I have seen uh, this city uh, develop, especially once I returned back from college, I realized that the city had changed just in four years and I didn't know the city and um, spent a lot of my time involved in local community organizations just to get to reintroduce myself to neighborhoods and like what was actually happening, always being someone who was serving. And I realized I was all throughout the city, you know, doing voter registration, neighborhood cleanup, and I wasn't in my own neighborhood. And I'm like, I need to do this in my own neighborhood, which really um, um, was the impetus for me getting deep into community work in my district that I now am able to serve. Um, and so previously to this position, I served on the Ailey School Board. So I was a school board trustee for four years and really um, brought my community development training um, to that work around schools, um, making sure that, you know, everything happening outside the school is unstable from housing to our streets, the quality of life, you're going to see it in the classroom. So, you know, when, when kids are living in unclean properties and uh, you know, they're, they're, they have no dedicated space to learn. They don't have a dedicated room. They don't have adequate food. You're going to see that manifest in the school. Um, aggression, uh, you're going to see, you know, they're going to be hungry. Test scores are going to be low. They're not going to actively participate in the school environment. So those are some of the things that I had championed um, as a trustee. And then I didn't run for re-election. And my, the neighborhood came back to me and they said, hey, we want you to run for city council. And I was shocked because I, that was not on my bingo board, as people would say. And they said, we have, you have our full support. We need you to commit. And once I committed, we were out the gate. And it's been a, a collaboration with community ever since. And you ran in 2019. You took office in 2020. Your term's up in 2024. Are you going to run again? Every day I go up and down. It depends on, you know, how many crazy emails I get. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like, y'all can have it this day. And then other days I'm so overwhelmed. My heart is full um, when we're able to resolve the problem. And so, um, yes, as of today, I plan on running again so we can continue the commitment um, and the promise that I made to invest in our public safety, neighborhood revitalization, youth engagement programming, and our quality of life, and we're doing that. So how much did you spend uh, in 2019? How much did you have to raise, and how much do you think you're going to have to raise now to, to, to win re-election? That's a really good question. How much did I spend? I would say off the top of my head, maybe 35000 I think, I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head. 2019 seems so long ago. Um, and it's just been a, um, a real interesting, like, political climate. It doesn't, you know, every, you know, voting season that I go out to vote, no one's outside. See, when 2019, when I was running, candidates, every, we were out there every day. Mm. And... It seems like ever since COVID happened, there's not that same engagement. And so um, that the people aren't as in, that's interesting that you say that I'm just as you say it, I'm thinking, well, is it because it's so easy? I mean, just so easy to be cynical about politics. And, oh, yes. And just so easy to say, oh, I don't care. And, you know, and I admire and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up your dress here that 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 you chose to serve, right? And I've only had a handful of politicians on the podcast. I've been doing hundred more than 120 episodes. I've had a couple of local officials in Iowa from Madison County. I've had uh, oh, wow. a California assemblyman, Jim Cooper, you, and I, I appreciate politicians. I appreciate that you care enough to do it, but, but why do you do it? I guess is one of the questions I have here is you said that they came to you, but yeah. why, what's that? Do you feel a responsibility that this is something you couldn't avoid that you had to do it? Tell me about that motivation. So, yeah. So for me, I, I think what, I think this is my political principle is that you cannot represent people without their permission. And I, for me, I've always been skeptical of, people that just, I'm going to do this. and I, But no, but you haven't talked to the people and have they said that you are our answer? Like we support you. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really important for the community to come to me. And I mean, multiple members to say, we want you to represent us because they were like, Tiffany, you live in the area. You you come up here. Like, you know where we are. You've been serving this neighborhood. Like you're not, we need you're not, a champion. You're not, you're not shy. 
You're not shy. <laughs> and we know that if something's going down, you're going to make it known. And, it's, and they know that. And every time the mayor he has to introduce me, he's like, listen, she's one of the most hands-on council members. Because it's true. I have an intimate knowledge of their issues. Mm. Um, I will decline every outside district event if there's a conflict with something in the district. And I don't care if it's four people at an HOA meeting. I'm going there. I'm mm. going to the four people. Um, because I, if you are able to solve a drainage problem that they've had for years, the, the way people... They're relieved because they finally feel like someone actually gets it. That government someone, might actually might actually work sometimes. They might actually do it. And I will tell you, one of the first things I did in office, there were requests for simple speed bumps for years that were not funded. I funded every single one immediately. Mm. Everything that was pending, fund it, get it, do it. We've gone through exhaustive sidewalk repair to make sure that it was up to code and ADA accessible because we have aging seniors that need to get around. So the you know the, the fun, pretty stuff that people like to do, the ribbon cuttings, we do that too. But I really like to take credit <laughs> and focus in on the infrastructure investments that we're making to enhance someone's quality of life. Even around uh, street lights, mm -hmm. I noticed in 2019 when I was teaching my community research class, we were doing a public safety study and a young girl worked at Burger King and she says, I get off at night, I try to walk home. There's no lights on Cook Road. There's no police presence. A friend of mine was robbed and I never forgot that. And so once I had the, the budget to do so, our budget increased for the council office. I, I released a streetlight initiative and to support our public safety efforts because we had public spaces that were not adequately lit. People didn't feel comfortable coming out. But what we noticed and what I'm learning going through the district looking at these lights is that we have either one, the lights don't work. The lights don't, two, the lights don't exist. Mm. Or three, the tree canopies are so large that they cover up whatever lighting structure there is. So we're doing two things. We're um, turning on the lights, invest, installing new lights, and then we're cutting back the tree. The tr so neighborhoods can actually be clear. Um, growing up, we played outside all day until right. the dark. And we knew when the street light came on, you come home. But today you can't do that. Um, and that's a particularly important public safety issue for young women, for women, I mean, for everyone, but that, that is a, that that's a key issue. So what's the hardest part of your job then? This is something that, you know, ugh. I do, I interview a lot of people and I, it's one of the things when uh, my, our, our children were younger, we'd take them and talk to, to, to entrepreneurs and, and we'd ask yeah. them, you know, mechanics, bakers, you know, what's the hardest part of your job? So you you clearly like what you do, but you also express some frustration with the job, which I would imagine would be pretty common. What's the hardest part of that, uh, being a council member in a city as big and uh, uh, complex as Houston? Hardest part of the job? That's a really good question. Uh, well, you can think about I, it. That's all right. I, mean, I, just, I, I don't mean to stump the you here. institution side, like the city institution side. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say that, you know, I think the mayor's really good at this. He's really good at crafting a bold vision. So then we're talking city. about Sylvester Turner here, so former, yes, former, mayor, state, mayor Turner, former, really state, good at, former state senator as well, right? Yes, state rep, state rep. State rep, okay, I'm sorry, yes, that's right, okay. Yes, yeah, state rep, and very, what he does that very well. I don't necessarily know if our systems match the vision. So he has very high expectations mm -hmm. and sometimes which causes delay and actually getting certain things done because certain departments are just the way that we've done it. It's always been this way, right? So we have a, a younger council at City Hall. And so we're thinking differently and we're challenging some of the ways that business have has been done, um, particularly looking at speed just with permitting. Like, mm. why is it so difficult just to get this permit done? Um, and then making sure that we have the workforce we need in the city. So I think a part of the challenge is from an institution, an institutional place, I'm always asking the question, well, why not? Like, I don't understand why. Like, well, why not? Like, why so, do I, so, why? So, so if I'm paraphrasing what I hear, what I think I'm hearing you say is that the difficult part of the job is contending with 
the 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 way things are right trying to get overcoming the inertia of the system the way the system has been for a long time and trying yeah. to get it prod it to make it move more yeah. efficiently faster etc efficiently and then the other side of that is educating that to the public uh-huh right? to keep so, their expectations in check or is that it was that to what keep you're saying them in check and just and just education and you'll be surprised the number of emails I get related to federal and state issue that we have no control over. Mm -hmm. And as city council members, we are the closest to the ground. Right. Closest. They're the and only so, politician you know that they know. And so they want you to help them try and navigate what's yeah, going because on. Because they'll see me at the grocery store in the post office. They see me and they're like, right. I need to talk to you. And I'm just trying to buy my milk. And they <laughs> they have a whole deal. And so e educating them really about the civic process mm -hmm. and then what is what and how, you know, which well, ties back, which, which ties back to the air properties and the complexities of those issues, which is, I mean, as you've described it, and now we, it's been a while, so, you know, a few minutes since we talked about it, I'm, I'm just reflecting on my own head about, damn, that's a complicated issue about complicated. how you then guide, you know, you said at least 96 homes and, 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 and heirs to properties that they have got to navigate a legal set of I'm going to say minefield, but it is a minefield yes, and it's going to be ex and it's going to be expensive for them to work all the way through these processes at the local and county level in terms of the deeds. And then then they have to go to the federal level if they want to try and get mold or, you know, re that. Yeah, I would see why that would be a very hard part of the job, because you got to tell your people, well, look, you know, I want to help you, but there's only so much I can do here. I want to help you. And, you know, for some neighborhoods, I literally have to hold their hands. I literally have to. You know, I, I, I will print their flyer. I will block walk their neighborhood. We we do all of that work for them. And how many people are on your staff? You have, I know, I we met, have Sherelle, three. We're met lean. Sherelle Duncan, and I've been in touch with, uh, oh, your colleague, uh, Ms. Uh, Kelly King. Is King, that right. right. Yeah. So four, so three and a half. Okay. So um, I have three and a half, we're lean, and we have four interns, So uh -huh. which gives me additional hands but as it relates because it's only 100 doors in piney point we physically and it's an older group we type out everything we put a flyer on their door their mailbox we knock on their door to remind them to come to the meeting and it's an extremely like high touch it's process difficult to do a high and high I, touch I, is that is that fair high touch process high touch high touch and i have neighborhoods that have eight sections just in one and i and so because their need is so particular um and i don't want them to fall victim to the having the wrong information uh people you know they have been manipulated and people have come before and asked them to sign over paperwork mm -hmm. um and a lot so there was an investor who was asking them to sign over their name so they would um he'll pay their property taxes and people actually did it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so then I had to stop everything and, you know, they reach out to me and like, Miss Tiffany, what do we do? He's going to pay us. Do we sign? No, he's going to put a lien on your home. <laughs> like, no, because he's trying to acquire the land. Sure, sure. And they don't know this. So because they have no, because they have no experience, no life experience with it. They don't know a lawyer. They don't. There's no nobody, no lawyer yeah. in the family or or, or, or whatever. They don't understand his long game and that they're in the prime. You know, they're right in the middle of the city and it's his prime real estate. They don't get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you said you're likely to run again. What? Um, you mentioned the ward system before, and this is something that's unique to Houston as well. And people talk about the fifth ward and the other wards. If you don't mind, just explain that real briefly. I mean, you lived in a Houston a long time, and I'm familiar with it. And I looked it up the other day about the, the ward system. Um, it sounds, it, it harks of some kind of machine politics or Chicago or something like yes. that. So tell what are the wards and how does that, these are vestiges of an older, older governmental system, aren't they? Yes, and, and how they would name uh, neighborhoods. Now, if we were in New Orleans, New Orleans actively uses the ward system. Mm -hmm. 17th Ward, Thorough Ward, 9th Ward. Um, but in Houston, not necessarily. They're now just known by their neighborhoods. Um, so 3rd Ward, 
Right. Um, uh, that's one. Fifth Ward, ma- majority of the historically Black neighborhoods are the wards, the third ward, the fifth ward. Um, fourth Ward, which is uh, now most known as Midtown, but that's Fourth Ward. Right. Um, and so from a historic preservation um, um, perspective, you know, the, the nomenclature of that is pr- pronounced so that history isn't erased. Um, sure. Because now going into those neighborhoods, they're proposing different name changes and people are very resistant to that. But we don't actively use that in every um, part of the city. It's just in embedded in the identity of those neighborhoods now. Sure. So you've been in Houston for a long time now. You said you started there in high school. Um, Houston is a famous food town, and I'll make a very di- quick digression. So a friend of mine, Rob Walsh, I worked. we worked together at the Austin Chronicle a very long time ago. He got a job at the Houston Press as the food writer. And the first story he wrote for the Houston Press, he drove himself to Intercontinental Airport, parked his car, and went to the taxi rank and jumped in the taxi, first taxi, and told the driver, take me to your favorite restaurant, which was going on to this idea about Houston as a cultural town and a very rich food town. And he wrote this really amazing story. I think he was taken to a halal restaurant. So that's the mm. brief tangent. And he wrote about it in a very sympathetic way. And to me, really was a great idea for us as a reporter, right? I, I think, well, that's just a great idea. And I've told that story yeah. many times. But Houston's a great food town. Tell me some of your favorite restaurants. Oh, my goodness. Um, just, I'm, putting um, the, I'm putting you on the spot here now. Well, Cajun Kitchen, okay. Cajun Kitchen is you have when you come to Houston, you have to you have to try their turkey necks ah, to die for the Asian, ah! Asian, Asian Kitchen, Asian, Cajun Kitchen, Cajun. So uh, spell it for Cajun me. Asian Kitchen. Yes, it's on okay. Wilcrest. You have to try their turkey necks to the, die for the Asian Kitchen on Wilcrest and get the turkey turkey necks. Yes. Okay, I've never, yes. I don't know that Cajun I've ever had. A, I, I don't know that I've ever had a turkey neck. You, listen, uh, you'll continue to come back to Houston for those turkey necks. I, I promise you that. Okay, that's the <laughs> only thing I eat there. I mean, I eat all the other stuff, but like, it's I'm committed to the turkey necks. Okay, and they're so good. People at City Hall are like, "Do you have my turkey necks?" Because no one <laughs> wants to drive out here, so they're like, "You need to bring those turkey necks to City Hall." I mean, they're okay. so I will say Cajun Kitchen. Um, is one. Okay, now, but sorry, you, now you're confusing me because I'm hearing what you're saying. You said Cajun. So Cajun spell, it, kitchen. S- spell it for me. C-A-J-U-N. Oh, Cajun. Cajun. Okay, okay, you're saying Cajun. I'm hearing K- I'm hearing Cajun, but okay, Cajun kitchen. Cajun. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, Cajun gotcha. kitchen. See, your New Orleans accent, I know you throw, you tossed out, <laughs> New, you tossed out New Orleans there a few minutes ago, so I'm just trying to catch up here. Okay, so Cajun kitchen, I'm going to get me some turkey next. What else? Oh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a little bit of everything. Um, Blake's Barbecue on Janetta, the historic Blake's Barbecue, which is right there in Piney Point. Okay. Uh, this is old school barbecue. I don't even think they write the order down. They're just like, what you want? Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> got it. Here you go. It is great. Their burgers are ridiculous. Okay. The salads are not even really salads. It's just a bunch of meat. It's amazing. <laughs> and the the the, the uh, ba- baked, bar- baked potato. Phenomenal. That's the old the old school style. Old school. Blake's barbecue right down Janetta. Okay. Uh, a part of the Piney Point footprint. Like we yeah, we fund lunches out of out of uh, out of Blake's. Um what else? Um well, two's good. I've got some more questions for you. you I, like, got another? I, I like mom and pops. So those yeah. are the mom and pops in the neighborhood. I got you. Um, so I, these are other questions that I ask all my guests. So I know you do a lot of reading for the city, your city work and a lot of policy papers and so on. When you're not necessarily working, what do you read? What's on your bookshelf? What, what other kind of things do you like to read? I have a tremendous amount of books. And so, and I have to because I teach, but this summer I'm not teaching. Mm. Um, I'm not teaching anything. I'm actually working on a grant, um, some community engagement work. And so right now I'm not reading anything and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I'm not reading anything. <laughs> You're taking a break. I'm ta- Yeah, I mean, I read an incredible amount of content. I'm constantly surrounded by it. So this summer I said, you know what? I'm not going to assign myself anything. I'm just going to relax a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay well, then just give me a couple. Home. Give me a couple. So I, you read a lot, but a couple of books that you'd recommend then, if not necessarily right now, but things that you've written, read recently that you like or are memorable. 
Let me see what's on this shelf. What am I reading? It's more of a scholarly book. Okay. Um, it's community practice. And that's so the, it's that's really, the title, community practice. Yeah, the okay. handbook of community practice. Okay. So the handbook of community practice is really good because, of course, I teach it, but a lot of the, a lot of the methodology in the book, really shows where there's gaps in how we do city work, and so a lot of the stuff that I offered is because I can take it back to that book, and it's a proven technique. Um, and really around, to help around, around, engage around, around, around engagement and around uh, participation. Around community. Yeah, absolutely. Around community engagement. And we don't, excuse me, we don't have, you, you know, when I was running for office and I was block walking and knocking on doors and I'm knocking on registered voters and active voters doors, you would be surprised how many did not realize an election was coming up. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and these are active voters. And so the idea for me, and really because of that book, uh, and I, I revisit it, it's tabbed up, I have highlighters and markers in it all the time, because um, it's a tool for me, I realized that the city doesn't do engagement that way. Mm -hmm. And so um, no one's knocking on your door from the city saying, hey, there's a housing development coming here, and we really want to get your feedback on that. We have related everything to technology and um, a survey online. Gotcha. You have the technology to do it. So I, I actively go back. I actively go back to the uh, handbook of community practice. Hmm. Uh, this is one question I just as you were saying this, I was uh, just popped in my head. So who do you admire? What you know, you, the, you've you've been you, you've talked about the Sylvester Turner. You've you've jumped into politics and you've been at this for a while. But uh, who do you, what role models do you have? And when you think about what you're doing now, either in your personal life or your professional life? You know, the, I, I think what I do is I take a piece, a little piece of everyone that's impressive to me. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're not big people on TV. Um, right. uh, quick story. I remember when Alexis Herman was labor of Sec secretary of labor under Clinton, I believe. And I remember there was a strike with FedEx or UPS or, or something like that. And I remember watching her on the news. So this is the 90s. I remember her watching her on the news and how she was dealing with that strike. And I would take clip articles about Alexis Herman. Fast forward, I'm involved with the National Urban League. She's the national secretary. I'm headed to Chicago and I write a letter to her and I said, hey, I'm coming. <laughs> this is weird. I, hey, I'm coming to this conference. I admire you. Would you be willing to have coffee with me? I meet her at the meeting. I tell her who I am. She like takes a hold of me and everyone was like, oh my God, you're talking to Alexis Herman. She was the most welcoming and offered the most sage advice um, around her strategy and her thinking as at that time, a young woman mm -hmm. as secretary of labor and in a you know White House administration. So I take moments like that when I witness people on the news and how they navigate hard environments, I might take that and start following them. So I can't say at this moment that there's one particular person. I think I am admiring moments, moments people have and seeing mm -hmm. how they rise to that occasion. So when it's my moment that I'll be prepared and it might be prepared by the language that they use, how they organize themselves. Those are the things that I'm borrowing from other people. And that's a touching story, though, that, uh, you know, that little bit of encouragement or that someone taking you aside made a big difference. Blew me away. Like, I was like, why is this lady talking to me? <laughs> I mean, just this is someone that, you know, I would see on TV growing right. up. And, you know, you, but it, you but never. It proves, but it proves you don't ask, you don't get. And you reached you, out and you she and you ask, touched something in her. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I've been going with that motto for a long time. And so I'm like, the most they can say is no. And I didn't realize how many people were not comfortable inserting themselves and saying, hi, I am such and such. Um, and I would like to. Mm -hmm. And um, as a, a faculty member and as, as a council member, every time I get an email from a student or a young person asking for time, it's absolutely. I so, will make time for that. So, so last question then here, and my guest is uh, is Council Member Houston City Council Member Tiffany D. Thomas. She represents District F in the Houston City Council. You can find her on the Houston 
It's Houston Techs, Houston TX dot gov slash council slash F slash index, which yes, it doesn't roll up, but you can find Tiffany pretty easily on uh, on the Google. So last question, if you don't mind. So what's what gives you hope? We've talked about a lot of things and some things that are problems that around these air properties that at, a, at the surface look pretty intractable. I mean, really hard. And, yes. and we face a lot of division in America, both economically, both in class, in terms of race, yep. in terms of yep. politics and geography, yep. and we're divided on a whole lot of things. And I could go on and on talking about all those challenges. But yep. what, what gives you optimism? What makes you hopeful? You know, I would say Tuesday, going into the Piney Point Civic Club meeting, I anticipated a very hard meeting. I thought I was going to be met with, I don't want it. What are y'all doing? Not my neighborhood. And it was the complete opposite. Mm. And it was the comments and the feedback from the residents that said, oh, my daughter should buy one of these homes. My grandchildren should buy one of these homes. The hope that we could make their neighborhood whole and that extensions of their family, their community, their legacy could return back they to could, their they beloved could, they neighborhood. Could see, they could see the possibility. They could see the possibility. And because they got it and I didn't have to do a hard sell. I just laid out the facts and just promised them that we would walk hand in hand. And they came to me and they were like, this is great. You're my hero. And that was the hope for me. Like, because oh they could God, see new could, new housing in a neighborhood that desperately needs it. That desperately needs it. And that, you know, because of the affordability, their grandchildren, their children, they're outside the neighborhood. They could actually come back. They don't have to live in the suburb of Katy. They don't have to live in Pearland. There's a possibility that they can come right back. And as they age as seniors and might need caretakers, they would be in the neighborhood. They could just walk around the street, around the corner in the city of Houston. So that was, I left just overwhelmed. Like we could actually do this. Mm. We could actually do this because the people, they get it. And so, and oft sometimes the people, it's the, the hardest barrier, but they got it. So I was very hopeful and I've been carrying that moment with me all week. Well, that's a good story to end on. Um, thank you for that one. That's great. Uh, my guest has been Tiffany D. Thomas. She's the uh, Houston, City, Houston City Council member in District F. You can find her very easily on the interweb. Uh, Tiffany, thanks a million for being on the podcast. I was uh, when I heard you speak in April. I thought, oh, this woman. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I want to talk to her some more. And I'm glad we finally made it happen. Thank you. All right. Thanks to you, Tiffany, and thanks to all you in podcast land. Until the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. See ya. Thank you.